विज्ञान के क्षेत्र में भारत एक ऊंची उड़ान लेने के लिए तैयार है मुझे ये बताने में बड़ी खुशी हो रही है कि सर उन्नीस से पहले भारत चंद्रमा पर अपना अंतरिक्ष यान भेजेगा इसका नाम होगा चंद्रयान प्रथम For those of us who may not be familiar with Hindi, that was the voice of the then Prime Minister of India, Atal Bihari Vajpayee. The Prime Minister announced that India was going to send the first of its lunar missions to the moon, which would be called the Chandrayaan. This was on the fifteenth of August, two thousand and three. But to take a step back for some of our young listeners. Here's a little back story. Have you heard of something called a Cold War between the United States and Soviet Union? Uh, yes, isn't it the one where they were both racing to create uh, to build a rocket first? And then I think the I think Russia won that race. So the so Russia sent the first man into space and US sent the first man to the moon. Yep, that is correct. So let me play a small clipping On the 12th of April, 1961, a Soviet Air Force pilot, Yuri Gagarin, became the first human to blast into space. So soon after that, the United States announced that not only would they send a rocket into space, they would also send a man to go and step on the moon. And here is the American President Kennedy making that announcement. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing. So, long story short, the Cold War between the two countries ended a few years later, and over a period of time, people lost interest in sending satellites and people to the moon because there were other problems on Earth, I guess. So, like, there were like the craze for the space thing. Is done right now. We have a lot of new stuff like high school tests. Like high school tests. Why not? That's what What's they wanted. What's worse to... than high school tests? <laughs> Nothing is really worse than that. <laughs> yeah, maybe they focused on things like high school tests, a few wars and conflicts here and there, and maybe some people going hungry. So they decided to spend money on these things. So in this backdrop it is interesting that the ISRO a space organization based out of India announced a mission to the moon in the year 2003 Can you guess why there was any interest in the moon why it had been revived Well maybe India just wanted to increase its um its what is it called prestige its image to the other countries by doing so when the british had already um just left it in a pretty fairly devastated manner that is true but if they had done it right after 1947 you might have been right okay i'll give you another hint then by now people were looking at the moon as sources of oh they wanted to see if the moon could become an a new place for mankind to live or at least a new place to find new elements to harness new energies etc etc bingo i think you might have hit the nail on the head i think somewhere there lies the truth that maybe people were beginning to explore the idea of living on moon one day mankind on the moon will look at earth and think wow what a far away place do you think one day we could go step on step over there assuming that we haven't destroyed earth no assuming but even if we have destroyed earth it won't be nothing anymore it'll still be something but on that very optimistic note i have just one quick story that i wanted to narrate on the name chandrayaan So when the ISRO scientists had submitted a proposal to the government saying that we'd like to send a series of missions to the moon they had given it a different name the mission was called somyan so som also means moon chandra also means moon but vajpay felt that chandra was a better name for the mission chandra in sanskrit means an object that reflects bright light So Vajpayee felt that 
India was going to become uh, potentially one of the greatest superpowers in space in the years to come. And to connote a bright future and how India might be able to shed a lot of light and knowledge on what the moon contains to the rest of the world, he chose the name Chandrayaan instead of Somyaan. So he kind of struck off that word on that folder and he said, let's call the mission Chandrayaan. Well, that certainly um, proved true. Because Chandrayaan 1 found water on the moon, then America confirmed that discovery, then Chandrayaan 3 found sulfur on the moon. So, quite a lot of light to shed. Okay, so we are getting a little ahead of ourselves. Let's introduce ourselves to listeners who've never heard us before on the podcast. Hi, you're listening to a podcast series on India's space journey. This is the last and final episode in this series. We cover the stories in the 21st century, especially the Mars Orbiter Mission or the Mangalyaan and the Lunar Mission series or the Chandrayaan. Hi, this is Sangeeta, the host of What's New Today. And joining me in this episode to talk about these stories is... Hi, my name is Adya. I'm from 7th grade. I live in India. Welcome, Adya. I know you've done a lot of reading, as must have been evident in the initial discussion that we've done. But tell me, um, what did you find most interesting about the Mars Orbiter mission, Mangalyaan? The fact that it was the first mission by like any country to succeed to go to Mars on its first try. Even okay. orbiting Mars or landing on Mars, it's still scored on the first try. So that's one thing that you really liked about how India got it right on the very first attempt. What else did you find interesting about what the orbiter found? I found the camera that India's Mars mission used very different from the NASA Mars mission. It was more like a normal camera, so it would show things from the same perspective that a normal human would see if they like looked out of Mangalyaan to see the Martian surface and it would show it in color. I'm guessing that NASA's would be a lot more like detailed. It would show everything in a little, in, in like very sharp detail, which may be good. But in this case, the human, this one is showing humans the mass the way they would have seen it. You're I fine. find that really cool. So you like the idea of seeing that reddish, brownish tinge on the Mars. Very interesting. Surface. And I'm guessing that NASA's camera will have also like sort of color coded everything depending on the different heights and and variations of temperature and so on. And that's not something you would want to see. No, okay. I want to see the it the way it is. Okay. What did you find interesting about the findings of Chandrayaan one? Chandrayaan one, it found water on the moon. That's not anything any other country has found before. Yeah! And the rocket that I think US launched soon after that only confirmed Chandrayaan's one's findings. That's pretty cool. The US did not launch a rocket. In fact, they sent one of their instruments aboard Chandrayaan 1 and that instrument also recorded water the same way as India's instruments did. So basically, the US had to rely on India to send one of their instruments to space? It's not that these countries rely on India. It is that if India is already building a mission... So like a two-for-one deal. They're launching the rocket anyway. Might as well send your own instruments with it, right? <laughs> Suppose I'm going to, I don't know, let's say Singapore Shopping, which is a shop near my house. So I sometimes go there to purchase a loaf of bread or something. And then I see um, a jar of peanut butter. So I'm like, hey, I'm getting some bread for a sandwich anyway. Why not get some peanut butter to go with it as well? You think that's how all these space agencies <laughs> decide to put their instruments on each other's vehicles? Yeah, but there is a little bit of friendship involved in it. The ISRO maintains a reasonably cordial relationship with the European Space Agency, the Soviet Union, the Japanese Space Agency, NASA, 
So even on Chandrayaan 3, as well as I think on Chandrayaan 2, there were a lot of instruments that these countries had also placed on our landers and rovers. So mm -hmm. these instruments will also be taking their readings when the Pragyan rover and the Vikram lander are on the moon. I see. So they're already taking pictures. Yeah, yeah. I'm hoping they'll share whatever the information they found with the world. Yeah, they do. For example, in Chandrayaan 1, we discovered water, right? We shared it with the world. Yeah. So before we wrap this up, what has the Chandrayaan 3 found? Well, the Chandrayaan 3 has found sulfur on the moon. I don't understand why it's such a big deal that Sulfur has been found on the moon. Okay, let me try and explain or understand why the discovery of sulfur is a little cool. So the yeah. presence of sulfur means that the chances of water ice being there goes up. So basically, I think the more sulfur, the more water. Yippee, right? Yep, yippee, that is right. So the next time mankind wants to carry its tents, and sleeping bags to the south pole of the moon, at least we'll be assured of there being enough water. And hopefully they'll be able to take the water, split the hydrogen and oxygen, and also use the hydrogen to generate fuel and the oxygen to breathe. So I have a quick question for you before we wrap up this podcast series. You've been hearing some of the stories of how the ISRO was formed about how there was a visionary by the name Vikram Sarabhai who thought that uh, space for India did not mean sending a man to the moon or space, but it meant utilizing the technology in space for, say, our farmers to get the right information or for us to get interesting TV shows. So which of these stories has been the most inspiring for you? I like the one about Vikram Sarabhai. The one when when he negotiated or convinced the bishop to give him his house, his entire house and the village. Wow! You found that the most interesting. Yes. Who do you recommend should listen to it? Just children or do you think even adults might find them interesting? What is your opinion? I think both children and adults would find them like really interesting. Because it not only outlines the entire history of India's space exploration, it even has some explanation in physics and how and how they built the whole rocket and everything. So that sounded really cool. And it showed some countries like US's opinion on underdeveloped research faculties. Such as US scientists came to, I think it was US, I don't know if it's the Soviet, Soviet Union, they came to the church and found scientists sitting on the floor and assembling pieces of the rocket. They reported back to whichever the country they belong to and called it horribly underdeveloped with horrible faculties. Facilities. Facilities. So what, what about it did you find? That it was completely distasteful. I wouldn't mind sitting on the floor and assembling rocket parts. <laughs> but they like were a not fun thing to do. Seems like a fun thing to do. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's like building Lego blocks mostly. <laughs> okay, I'm glad that that's how you think of it. It's sitting in 2023. On that very, very positive note, we wrap up this podcast series on India's space journey. So like Adya said, in the event you haven't heard the stories, uh, I think we've tried to put together a fair balance of stories and a little bit of science explained along the way. Uh, lots of trivia that our textbooks do not usually contain and many interesting pieces of information and opinions that children have shared along the way in each and every episode. There's a beautiful blog that we've put together which outlines all the stories that we have discussed in the podcast. They don't contain the reactions of children, but the blog just outlines all the stories. In the event you're someone who enjoys reading, just the stories, you can find link to the blog in the show notes below. But if you're someone who would also like to hear the opinions of children and what they think about lives then, I'd suggest you go back to part one of this podcast series and begin right there. 
Adya, I really enjoyed our chat today. Yes, so did I. Thanks for listening.